Welcome to part two of our expansive chat about rack gear with the amazing Michael Torren. If you haven't checked out last week's episode, I would highly recommend it. Get a bit of a background into Michael's musical journey as well as some of the amazing gear that they've got. If you have watched that episode, let's pick it right up where we left it. The other one that, that still haunts me is um, Langner made a Brutus power amp, giant power amp. And there was one for sale, um, and those are those are rarer than the preamps. There yep. was one for sale about an hour and a half south of me that was non-functional, mm-hmm. but still over a thousand dollars. And I'm like, God, I can't, yeah. I can't, I don't know if I can do that because I mean, like, yeah, I could probably get it fixed, but you know. and it was gone within hours. And I, mm. I don't know when I'm gonna see one of those. <laughs> Maybe eventually, you know, ten years from now, who knows? it'll come up. I, um, now, my biggest sorry, gear that you we should do a, uh, an episode about this, Leon, like the gear that got away. But the the number one that always comes up is, um, you know, Leon and I both um, spent a lot of time when we were younger watching the Paul Gilbert instructional videos. And um, in the the Intense Rock 2, he's playing, I think it's a a ghost, it's it's the Ghost Rider, isn't it? Or maybe that was the, yeah, I think it's a Ghost Rider. Or maybe I'm getting mixed up with like the Sean Lane guitar. It was one of the two. Now I'm being silly, but one came up a really affordable price, about an hour from where I live. And I'm- I remember seeing it and I just like, I have to have this guitar. It's just, it, it is top of the pile. I'm never going to play it. I have to own it. And I messaged the person straight away. Yep. Great. No worries. Come pick it up. And um, I was on my way to get it and they messaged, oh, it's gone. I'm like, I've, I've never X. seen one. I've never seen one before that. I've never seen one since, particularly so close at such a good price and they're just gone. So anyway, that was, that's my, um, my similar sort of story. All right. So on that note about the ones that got away in some of the best rack effects, I think for me it's <clears throat> I'm going to put the H3000 in there. Like that's a if you're going to if you if you're going to represent the glory of rack gear with one unit, that's it. Uh, or the 2290. But uh, I really like the Sony DPS uh, oh. series that they did. If you, if you so they have a model called the M7, and it's their modulation, right? Oh, wow. Okay. But there's an effect in there called the spiral modulation, and it's a delay. And it's like got pitch shifting and stuff. But, dude, you need one, and you need to, like, hear it in stereo because you know how the 2290 has a phase invert thing, so it sounds like it's coming from behind your head? This does this, like, figure eight thing where basically it's like you kind of hear, feels like the echoes go, it's like an Escher ping pong. That's the way I would describe it. It sounds like like you get a left channel ping, and then the pong is behind your head. And then you get a right channel pong and then you get another one. It's like, it's just amazing. Um, oh it's God. in the, it's in the video I did with it. If you want to look it up, but it's oh. like such a unique thing, really good chorus, really good detune. And it's the hardest thing to edit because it's one parameter per page. And like some effects have a hundred parameters. So you're like scroll tweak. It's good. It's just, but the presets are great. So that would be, <laughs> that'd be fun. And the reverb sounds amazing. Um, oh, yeah. The delay is pretty good, but yeah, the reverb and the modulation, I think, are well worth. I think then they put out the V77, which has all that stuff anyway. Okay. So that that, that would be that would be one that I would say you it's might. Like that. Tell me about yeah. the amp, though. Like, what's <laughs> what's going on back there? And then I and, want to hear about how it's all connected to. Yeah. Okay. I'll talk to you a little bit. <laughs> Nielsen mentioned that you've got all this stuff kind of like ready to go, which I think is super yeah. cool. It, it is. It's a lot of work. I'll say it that way. And, and you would, I would not show anybody, probably but him, what looks like behind <laughs> everything. <laughs> although one, I'll tell you one thing. One thing that I was very smart about is there's at least a two foot gap between any of the racks in the wall mm-hmm. and any of the amps in the wall. So that way, I can get back there, unrack, re-rack, rewire, and everything else. Because if I, you don't do that, you're yeah. kind of no, yeah. You, you yeah. I mean, uh, the three, the three standing rack next to me. Even unloaded with 300 pounds. There's All no right. way, even though even though it's on casters, there's no way you're moving this thing. It's 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 ridiculous. Um, and I built the I built the two rack as a copy to that because I wanted to expand. I'm, I'm going to build another 126U for the probably for the base side mm-hmm. kind of consolidate because that's, that's the one thing. It's like a, it's like a goldfish in a fishbowl. You know, the, the bigger the fishbowl, the, the the bigger the. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh-huh. So things grow up. You know, hit the ceiling. I need I need more room. So we got to you know keep moving. Around. So that's <laughs> that is that is that. Yeah. You know, the one thing I was going to say, close out the rack thing is, yeah, I, I didn't choose what what should be on the top five <laughs> based upon you know glo- you know glory and lore and all everything else because it would have been like like you said the three thousand it'd be, um, 
probably probably one of the lexicons, you know, the PCM, some something like that. Like a forty two yeah. would be a great one too. Mm. I went for like the non standard, you know. Well, except for the one twenty six. One twenty the MXR one twenty six is pretty pretty much the the flanger. But, That's awesome. Yeah. So back yeah, back there I've got um and I lit it up for you guys. You can see it three 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 ampete. Yeah, both those ampetes, yeah. So that's kind of the heart of the whole system. Um, amp number one is the rack. So I have that sending the guitar signal all the way across to the rack going into all of my, my preamp. Well, all the preamps. So you want to do the rack dive or do the bigger dive and then go back to the rack and see how the rack fits in. Because it kind of, there's a fork right there. It comes back. I tell you okay. what, can we talk before we do that? Can you just talk through some of the amps that you got back there first, and yeah. then let's talk about the signal flow of it? Because I'm curious, because yeah, yeah. I can see some cool cabs. Is that the is that the Vi cab that Nielsen did the? Yeah, yeah. The yeah, it's it's being stored lovingly in in the Michael Tor collection. <laughs> yep. it's, I, I joke with him actually. Is is every time he he thinks or he's contemplating selling something like an amp or something, I'm like, you know. The torn home for wayward amps is always open. <laughs> <laughs> you could always visit any time. Yeah, <laughs> they could live here and still, you know. How far away from each other are you guys? I can't remember. He might have mentioned, but you pretty close. We're we're about we're about twenty minutes apart. Oh, 20 minutes is nothing. So so we're not far. Yeah. we're not we're not that far. Leon and I are forty um, minutes away from each other. So yeah. that's why we do oh, this so over Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't know, sit next to each other and then just kind of. Oh, yeah, yeah. we did it once. Oh. so but, um. So I'll yeah I'll go I'll go all the way down. So the top top is a Supro. Um, that is a Statesman fifty. It is not revered because it's a non master volume map. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, you have to have an attenuator for it, and that that kills the market for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. why a lot of people don't really appreciate their own, you know, nineteen fifty nine Marshalls because uh -huh. you need to have you need to tame the savage beast. So, but it's a cool amp, and it's got a uh, it's got a channel that is emulating. Um, an old Supro Thunderbolt. And I actually have a 66 Thunderbolt under a cover back back there that I need to, I need to compare at one point to see if the preamp is really, really the same. Um, below that is a 66 Super Reverb that I've turned turned into a head. Mm -hmm. I'm not a combo guy. I own I own like yeah. five combos. I? And two of them aren't even used as combos. They're turned sideways and up in the rack. Yep. Um, <laughs> below that's an 82 JCM 800 underwater. Uh, 73 super lead, 69 super lead. Uh, very top is the Eggnator um, class amp. That is a single channel 8030, which Leon, you just did a video not too long about. Yeah, yeah, really, really good. It is, but I, I joke about that. That is the least mar <laughs> orange sounding orange <laughs> I've ever heard. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't quite get into that like sludge territory. It's a. It's definitely. Yeah. It, it's like a meteor AC30 or something, right? It's very boxy. Yeah. Yeah, it's it straddles that Marshall Voxy thing. Below it is a um, seventy eight OR one hundred and twenty uh, master volume. That's so that's that's, that's, that's what weird. I'm comparing it to. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Gytron, which is a really cool amp. So Gytron, if you don't know, um, they were doing a load and reamp well before anybody else. So you've got two channel preamp going into um, an EL eighty four um, style power amp. That then hits a, I don't know if it's a reactive resistive load, hits a load and then is reamped by EO 34s. So you can crank the snot out of it, wow. get power temp, temp distortion, and then master volume almost almost like, like a power, a power station, station yeah, yeah. before a power station existed. Right, right. Yep. So that's what that's what that Gytron is is all about. Um, below that is a diesel VH4 mm -hmm. formerly owned by a YouTube personality we all know. Michael Did Nielsen? Take a guess. No? No? Oh. Tim they, Pierce? They, yes. Really? <laughs> that's Tim Pierce's old VH4. That's wow, cool. that's cool. I'm it, it's, uh, it sounds awesome. I thought he used that on a lot of stuff, too. That's surprising he sold he, it. He he did, and and, and I've, I've silently planted little subliminal messages in the chat and <laughs> <laughs> when he's on places and just asked him, so why'd you sell this? And And I've actually, I've got clips of it. Where he says, you know, I really kind of, I'm really kind of regretting that I sold it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, and I'm like, it's still in the valley. You're not that far from me. <laughs> but he sold it because he got the, he got the new Bad Cats. Oh, okay. And the, and the Bad Cat did the, the lead sound better than the VH4 in his, in his ears. Right. 
Um, so even though it was a great versatile amp, it didn't fit in that that vein. Um, so I, I saw it go for sale. And, and the crazy thing about it, there was no celebrity tax on it. Really? It was market value VH4. And I'm like, I am grabbing that right now. Wow. Man, so, good man, Tim Pierce. Yeah, there are so yeah, few of those. <laughs> there are so few of those here. Um, I've recorded one once, but they're like prohibitively expensive in Australia. Oh, wow. Yeah, like that just, you just can't get them. Uh, unless you want to shell out eight grand. Um, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. That's what they retail for. Like that's Australians. So that's probably like six grand US or something. Five and a half. That's still insane. Yeah. That's... And secondhand, they just don't pop up. So, oh my God. Same as, um, uh, interestingly enough, I saw a, a Leon, I, I meant to message you that there's an SLO uh, 100, like a red SLO heading cabinet. Wow. Um, but oh, it's wow. like seven and a half grand Australian. <laughs> and like that'd be nice, but I don't really want to spend that much money. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, it's, yeah, those are getting crazy. Actually, even even out here, those are getting pretty crazy. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, admittedly, I'm I'm in one of the better gear markets in the country. Yeah, in the U.S. at least. And I I travel across the country for work, and everywhere I go, I hit I hit Craigslist just to see, you know, what's out there. And L.A. has, I mean, I don't know how many pages. It's like thousands of listings. Mm. You go to Austin and there's hundreds of listings. So it's be- it's better than most of the smaller places, but it's still not LA. Nashville's probably Nashville and New York are probably the only two other cities where you can scroll through pages and pages of listings before you get to the, like super old stuff. Yep. I mean Seattle was actually not as big as I thought it would be either. Mm. But I've done that trip. Like, Dallas, all right, what's in Dallas? All right, let's see what we got going on. And uh yeah, it's so part of this is just geographically where I happen to be, it's easier to find some of the gear. Yep. Um yes. So uh, tops of JJ um, 100, nice. JJ 100. Um, JL is over at Nielsen's, but in its place is the VHD Deliverance 60. Mm-hmm. Um, below that is a top hat uh, in Plexidor. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, that's an underrated company, aren't they? It is. Pete Thorne's although... got one, right? That's where I've seen it before. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pete Thorne has a top hat. He's got, I don't know if he's got an in Plexidor. I think he might have. A different model. Okay, that's the only other um, place of time. A place of yeah, same he's, one. He's, he's, got, he's definitely got a head. I just don't know if it's the same head. Right. This head actually. Oh man, used to belong to the original guitar player for Buck Cherry. Oh, okay. I'm trying to remember his, his name though <laughs> for Orville. Um, but what, one of the good things about the LA market, there's there's a couple of different clearing houses for musicians that are just wanting to sell gear. Right. And if you know those sources, you can just sit there and scroll through all the stuff they're selling. Gotcha. Just to see. Now. Now, granted, some of that stuff has the celebrity tax on it. Some of it mm. doesn't. That one didn't. Um, this the studio desk right here that I'm I'm working with here. I got for a stupid deal because number one, nobody wants traditional giant studio desk anymore because I mean we're all in the box and you don't need yeah. all this outboard gear anymore. Um, so that's one thing. And then the company that was selling it was moving, and ah. they started a, they started a price way up because it's a um, oh what's the name of the company. It's, it's a pretty well-known brand that started way up in the several thousand range. Mm-hmm. And I just watched this thing drop <laughs> as no one was buying it. And then they started, they got, they were moving and basically 500 bucks is yours. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, all right, I'll take it. And it was like, again, 300 pounds to move this thing out of there. Oh, put it in. Um, but <clears throat> I can't remember whose this was. This was, I'm going to say it's one of two guys. I'm going to say it's Adrian Vandenberg's. All right. Oh. So it was in his home. Yeah, it was in home studio. <laughs> I was like, "Damn, okay." I'm just regardless of it was his. Yeah. I'm buying that. <laughs> Went over there with my truck, loaded it in, came through, and luckily I have a big enough door that I can get it through this thing. <laughs> and then landed it here, and then loaded it up, and yeah, it's it's awesome. Um, that's so cool. All that's, right, so, so that's the top hat. We're and then we kind of four now. We, we veer, yeah, we veer off in. The very top is a AC30 CC2. So it's the mm-hmm. I've got one of those five, six hundred dollar, you know, custom classic, which actually is really good until you A B it against the other box AC kind of stuff. And then you realize that what you're missing. Yep. But by itself, it's an awesome piece, and you would probably be happy. I think Tim Beers talked about it being being all you really need. And honestly, you know, unless you miss the, the, the girth and some of the, the punch, it, it gets you the sound, really. Um, I've used mine quite a lot. That. Like I've used mine quite a lot in sessions over the last few years. Like Leon, I think we've used it quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, great. A, yeah, great. Like they do yeah, the it's job. A great so. amp. That that one actually 
the guy didn't even bother cleaning it. Like it looked nasty in, in the ad. No one was buying it. There was like some type of grease was smeared over the top oh, of the wow. faceplate. It arrived exactly like it saw in the ad. I just cleaned it and now it looks, you know, like, like a real ad. Um, below is that Nailer Electro Rib 38, mm-hmm. which which Michael Nilsson did a video about. It's a, it's, a, it's a great amp too. That's more on the AC30 reverb side. Uh, below that is an S- S- Nailer Super Drive 60, which is the flagship head that he made. Um, below that's a divided by 13 RSA 23. Okay, now that's kind of a Vox adjacent thing, right? Yeah, yeah, that's the Vox adjacent made here locally in Southern California. Um, Bogner Ecstasy mm-hmm. with, with the nice snake skin. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> Matching cab 4x12 is underneath <laughs> it, but you can't really see it. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, Top is a one on overdrive reverb. Mm-hmm. So it's the it's the dumble with the reverb type of deal from those guys. Below that is a 63 AC30 head. So it's a super, uh, what do they call it? Um, anyway, it's the real deal that I compared all of them to. So that's um, the one. That's the, well, it, it, it does a thing. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. But some of these other amps get so close that it's kind of like, all right, do you, do you really need to spend the money for the real deal or yeah. could you get by? The sad thing is the guy right below it, which is right there up with it, costs the same price. So a DC-30 matchless is the same price as a 63 AC-30. Yeah, right. Yep. Just with, with a lot more horsepower. And then below that is a Bad Cat Panther R, mm-hmm. which is a kind of rare rare one. It's a reverb and it's, it's probably the most dumb thing I own even with the overdrive reverb. Yep. Um, it's got it's got a bottom end that is just it's ridiculous. It is like it'll shake the room almost kind of bottom yeah, end. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's it's, it's insane. And it's what so you don't see before you before you go on with the rest yeah. of the stuff, it's like a lot of the time, you know, there's <clears throat> there's like YouTube guitar dude with amps on the amp rack that everybody has aesthetic, where it's just like a dozen high gain amps. Um, I kind of like that you've got the token high gain stuff in there, you know, the Friedmans and the Bogners. You've got some nice plexis, but kind of a lot of like Vox, you know, and orange stuff in there, like stuff that's not insanely saturated, like stuff that has character, if you want to say, like or a different character. There's quite a breadth in there. You yeah. know, it's actually a, a diverse set of amps rather than like here's like 11 different modded plexis. Which is cool, yeah. Thing. Yeah. but you know, I kind of appreciate that about the amp collection. Yeah, it, it is. I wanted to cover a lot of bases, um, and I'll, I'll give you the last amp in 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 the loop here, and then I'll tell you why. So the last one behind here is a combo that I use as a head. Um, behind the couch right here is a. Uh, it's another Vox. It's a Vox AC30, but it's a 50th anniversary, which was made in a mahogany cabinet. Oh, okay. So it's got two two Chinese on on Eco Blues. Um, but the but the preamp is is what makes it special. They did a hand wire, and one channel is the EF eighty six preamp channel, mm-hmm. and the other is the twelve AX seven. And that okay. EF eighty six channel did, was done really well. It does something that none of the other amps do. Right. So I run it in there, and it's another non master volume amp that kills the market for the for everybody. Because <laughs> yeah, and a combo at that. Who makes a combo yeah. that's non master? It's one. So that's why it's not revered probably as well as it could be. Um, but to, to answer, I am, you know, I appreciate the, the high gain thing. My home base is something boxy with filter trons. Right. Okay. That's, that's me, which is the reason why you see this side of the way, well, kind of, my partner, this side of the way it is. Now, I, I appreciate all the high gain stuff, but that's really where I am. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you Billy Duffy earlier, and I've been listening to yeah. a lot of cult recently, so, you know, Filtertron's AC30, maybe like a few boss pedals in front, and that's kind of that's yeah. the sound, you know. Um, oh, yeah. It's with like play guitar like Malcolm Young, but through a Vox instead of a Marshall, and that's kind of the kind of the vibe. So yeah, that's that's yeah. kind of cool. And there is, uh, you know, you kind of mentioned the like rack enthusiast Facebook groups and things like that, where you know this isn't a knock on it because you'll like what you like, but 95% of people are going for Lukather Landau Huff. You know, that's the, that's the base with a lot of this stuff, but you forget that 
a lot of this stuff just would have been what was available in the 80s and like a lot of great sounds. And it's something that I've been turned on to a little bit because people watch the videos I do with modulation effects or rack stuff and they're like, oh, do you realize that like that's the cure flanger or that's the, <laughs> like, the Billy Duffy thing that he did or that's the, you know, the Smiths yeah. or something like that. Kind of like you forget that there were all these other other styles of music which used effects heavily that weren't just like hair metal. Yeah. Right, Shit right. music. No, well, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, think about the time too. Everybody went in the 90s to this rack phase where they ditched other other equipment and to, even Billy Duffy on the on the tone talk he did talked about or he did a tour with a rack setup, you know, with a couple yeah, right. of SDE three thousands and and uh, and did the whole thing. I think I think everybody from that era had a rack at some point. Yeah, I mean, Zach had the rack with the with the GP one thousands and the SPX nineties. I mean, Jerry Cantrell had a fish with a um, with a MOS valve and some effects. So I mean, everybody went through that. So I bet you if you go if you go far enough back, you'll see everybody out of rack at that, yeah, that yeah. time period. Well, I remember guitar magazines that I would read in like the early two thousands because I think Steph Carpenter from Deftones, like he was yeah. still rocking that stuff for a while. But it, maybe it's it was one of the first guitar magazines I read in like two thousand one, two thousand two, and he was on the cover. And then you see his rack, and it's like, well, that's what they use. Like that, it's almost like it's burnt into my brain that that's what professionals do is they have this thing. <laughs> And I've always had that in my brain, and you know. Yeah, obviously. but there's also the element of you know, for those guys, it's like I got to go out and do the album now, and we used weird stuff on it, so I need something that isn't going to break, can easily have a backup, and you know, can just be like wheeled onto a stage at a festival and put straight back in a truck, you know. So yeah. do that with a rack, do that with a pedal board. You're going to lose the pedal board, you know, because it's small. Whereas like have this like. 16 space rack, even though it's mostly like, oh, there's where I keep my underwear and a bunch of other stuff is, it just makes sense from a, like a logistic perspective. Yeah. So well, and it, they had a whole cartage industry of moving that stuff around, which yeah, yeah, right? yeah it just blows my mind. Yeah. Oh man. I, I wish that was an industry that still existed over here because, um, <laughs> man, I just, I'm so bloody over moving gear. It's why <laughs> everything I do, it's one trip from the car. If I can't do it from one trip, then I won't take the equipment. Well, that's, that's the thing I think about is, I mean, the last time I was on a stage was almost 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was playing bass in, in the, the band I, I was in 20 years ago. We had a reunion show. Right. And uh, and I was thinking about it. I go, if I ever started gigging again, I mean, one of the, I wouldn't bring a rack. No. <laughs> I'd go buy a preamp pedal, I'd stick it and go front of house and call it a day. Yep. But because it's logistically, yeah, we're at the age where like, no, it's, you know, let's make it easy, not make it hard. Man, so, yeah, yeah. Just, for nostalgia's sake, I would love to, but yeah, yeah, it would be it'd be prohibitive almost. When really. I started playing bass with Leon, like when was that? Twenty eleven, um, yep. which I didn't, didn't play bass at all. I just had to learn on the fly a bit. But we did a lot of gigs where it was just rock up with a bass and a cable and plug it straight into the PA because didn't have a rig, and also we played to approximately three people on a good exactly. night. So <laughs> it's so oh, you can hear the bass now. That's close <laughs> enough. It's quite funny. <laughs> You know, you know what's crazy is um, one thing I loved about that GK eight hundred RB when I used to play in, in Hollywood is it had a, it was the only amp on the market that I could think of that had an XLR D out. All right, okay. Because I would I would show up to the whiskey and the guy would have a D out box on top of the amp. Mm -hmm. So the only the only thing you're hearing on stage is the amp, but everybody else is hearing this dry sound going into the, whatever he did to you on the other side. Right. I have. Whereas, a, no, you yeah. go. Uh, well, sorry, I was going to say I when I used to do front of house, um, which was now quite a long time ago, but that used to always confuse me. And I remember talking to um, other front of house guys about that, where they would say, well, you know, we DI the bass because there's a um, uh, a backup in case the amp blows up and da da da, which is like kind of bullshit. You know, it's, you don't do that with guitar. You don't do it with anything else. Like, why would you just do that with bass? It's because you don't have any other way of plugging it in. But really like, at least if you run in the front of an amp and through an XLR out or take a effects loop send or something like that, you're getting what a bass is like, sort of like the co collection of, you know, the preamps yeah, and stuff. Good. And yeah, when I do um, sessions now um, and particularly teaching is part of it and um, you know, other sessions, like I have to put a Sans amp plug in on like, cause otherwise it doesn't sound like bass. It sounds too clanky clanky. And yeah. I do it with students and you go, look, here is, uh, here's your clean DI'd bass and it's fine. You can hear it. It sounds usable, but just that little bit of 
ampiness, like a little bit of scoop in the mid range and a bit more balls in the bottom end and maybe smoothing off the top, which it's immediate from either, yeah. in my opinion, XLR out of a base amp or whatever. It's, it's easy. It's not that hard. <laughs> it's um, yeah. But it's important to to the to char- the character of the sound. So anyway, well here's oh here if you could you know I'll unplug it real quick. I mean this is what I'm doing. I'm taking a P split. Oh cool. Um, one go. One goes into my mic pre up here, and the other goes into my rack that goes into the preamps. So I have a clean signal going into. Let me get rid of. I have a clean going into the mic pre into the DAW, and then I go through the preamps, through a power amp into a cab, and I mic the cab. Yep. So I get I get dry, and I get the other, and I can go and blend and do whatever I need to do. Yeah, there it is. Yep, the one. I, Those are awesome. I had that here for a long time because that was how actually i'll tell you my routing quickly because I, I just can't wait to talk about yours but um what i was doing until i got the um khe selector and before that the delisle what's it called leon the delise delisle delisle, delisle which i only just sold yeah i just sold that yesterday um oh, cool. but i was using the p split into like so guitar into the p split and then the p split went into a tuner and then into like the rack amp racks and then same deal the other side went into the um uh, a mic preamp for a DI, but I actually found um, it, it's it was just a little bit too noisy. I was getting too much re- uh, like RF. Um, really? Yeah, it was it was funny, and it was it was different. I, it was never repeatable. Um, like the ground lift setting, or there might be another switch on there too. Sometimes it was okay. Sometimes it was in on one and out on the other amp. It was really, really, really strange. Um, I use a um, a Little Labs um, DI reamp now and just you know guitar goes into that and then it splits out to the rest of the signal chain and it's pretty pretty straightforward and haven't had any issues with that so far but who knows um now actually part of that is oh i I really am curious when we talk about your signal flow because (laughs) with so much cabling I'm really. Oh yeah, and it is insane. Do you know the first thing that came to mind, and it's the most boring thing for most people, but I'm just really curious. So your ampeats, right? So that's controlling the whole the whole setup. So the whole on the other side of the room, that's where your preamp rack is, right? And channel one. So how are you getting like that? That's a fairly long run, isn't it, from the ampeats to the the uh, The rack rack? Um, Yeah, is that. Are, are you getting around that anyway? Do you find, is there any added noise or anything from that length of cable run or? It, it's not so much noise. It's signal loss, high end signal, signal okay. loss. Because the capacitance, of the, it's about a 50 foot run if you did it by cable. Right. All the way around and then around. Wow. Um, <laughs> if if I wanted to be a preamp to, um, to an actual amp, mm-hmm. like a preamp and a power amp to that, I would have to run, I'd have to either run the out all the way here or I have to go and wireless my way from <laughs> the back there to here, which I do because I'm lazy and I'm, you know, I'm, yep. and I want to be able to take the guitar around and do whatever I want to do. So, but yeah, basically the, if I choose the rack, um, which is channel one of the, of the first amp, of the first amp beat, I have that output routed to the input of the, of the rack system. Let me get, I'll tell you how that flow goes. So, and then yeah, so- if you look at it, and then yeah. so two uh, channel two so you got three amp each, so they're eight yeah. ch- eight amps per unit so there's twenty four right. channels right and and actually we didn't talk about the cabs so I can see five cabs is that what you've got set up I've got it? I've got one two three four five six seven eight nine I have ten cabs ten cabs right. okay so yeah, yeah clearly one and a one and a bit that you're using for that um man I'm just like. I just love this. So and, we, much. and we can go into with speakers on those cabs because it's it's black backs, gray back, green backs. Oh, we'll come back to that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm like staring over your head at the ampeats. I'm just trying to think oh. about what I want to ask you about. Um, and the remote. Check out the remote right next to it. That's why I, I really didn't want to get rid of the ampeats yeah, for, right. for a very critical reason, um, which I haven't remedied yet, but I have a solution for it. Okay. Because we were messaging so, about that, weren't we? The, I, I think you asked about my little yeah. app thing. Yeah. 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 I, I've got three KHE amp switchers and a cab switcher in boxes right in front of this divided by 13 right here that's going to go away shortly. Awesome. <laughs> so I was going to go and just gut this, uh-huh. put the KHEs up there because the KHEs will route everything into one speaker output mm-hmm. and then global attenuator into all the cabs. Yep. Right now, my current setup, I can only take the ampete and these three three ampetes, I can only attenuate one cap, yeah, one right. output to one cap. 
which sucks because I want to run all my cabs and be able to switch between all my cabs and still have everything attenuated, especially with the master volume amps. Yep. I bought that. It arrived. And the next day, and Pete emails me and says, hey, we got this workaround. We, we think you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I'm listening because I really love the way that it's working now. Yep. And what they're doing is there's a, you buy, oh, I'll grab it. Okay. Go back there. No worries. Um, yeah, for those of you that don't have the um, uh, the KHG, there is a, a loop, uh, a attenuator loop on it, and the delays. What, what, I, what I still can't remember that you said it two seconds ago, but um, yeah, there's an effects loop that's switchable in and out, so it makes it very um, easy to put your favorite. Uh, I have a torpedo in mine, and yeah, okay, so that's the oh, merge cab merge box. Okay, yeah, uh, merge box. So you can take two of these, and then. You're you're strung to only eight cabs in the first ampere that you can globally attenuate to or send the output after it's attenuated to, but that's good enough for me. I I'll live with eight. Yeah. So you can basically route the amps from the bottom, merge them, bring them up, and then we can we can wire this. That's that's my next big that's project cool. is to go do that. And that way I don't have to take the. <laughs> I'm not going to return the, the KHEs. The KHEs are actually going to go into the rack and replace the switchers I have in the rack. Yeah. That's an upgrade. That's a yeah. That's an upgrade, and they're one U, which is even better. Yeah, yep. they're really. Yeah. Did you get the um the eight by four ones? I got the eight only with no oh, with the yeah. one out. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. That way I can I can yeah. That way I can always go and then one feed back to the rack back here to go back into the rotation. So yeah. so what I was saying on the ampeats one is the rack, two is the soup um super reverb, mm -hmm. then it goes clockwise kind of up and down up and down up and down up and down all the way through gotcha on on the cab side cab one is an m is a aux box which is underneath here in the desk mm -hmm. so i can go direct the aux into the into the daw two is the power station up top mm -hmm. and then three starts all the cabs as they go across the right. um the torpedo up there is really only for the 69 super lead oh, okay so i can attenuate it and go to any cab i want but i had to dedicate it you know, uh, yep. a yep. load box to they just have. that one app. Yeah. That's um, that's but, the uh, load box that I have as well. The um, the torpedo yeah. reload, which works great. The um, the way I've got mine set up is so. Well, yeah, that's in the loop of my KHE. I've got the eight, the eight into four one. So yeah, it's got the attenuated loop in it. Um, okay, but because the reload also works as a like load box as well as an attenuator, I send the um, the line output of that into Pro Tools if I want to use it as a um, as a what do you call it, a load box uh, thing for wall of sound and that way everything every amp filters through that with no required patching as whichever one's selected it's automatically going to go simultaneously to Pro Tools um, basically when my daughter was born I had a lot of time when I was up all night and just I had to be awake because I was holding her she wouldn't go to sleep so all I was doing was watching the Simpsons on my phone and then in between that I was trying to work out how my new guitar rig was going to go together so I had a lot of ideas and a lot of theories but one of the other things that I was thinking about doing was replacing the torpedo with a power station and specifically the PS100 I think it was and I okay. don't know if this was doable or not but I had I had an idea that I'd be able to send signal from the rack preamps that I have into the effects. I think it was the effects return of the PS 100 yeah. and then also have the PS 100 in the loop of the KHE switch. And then v by switching, like, cause it's got the, um, I think it's got an effects loop switch on the back on, on, on it, on the unit. Yeah. So when the switch is in one position, it just acts as the attenuator uh, for the amps coming in. And when it, is in the other position it disconnects the as an attenuator and just turns it into the return from the rack preamps so i could still run everything together without having to chew up a um uh, an output on the khe selector so there was a lot of like silly <laughs> routing things that i came up with i wasn't able to in implement it because at the time i could not get a power station in australia like that was sold out for, for ages and ages so i um, wow. went in other directions but anyway your situation is way more impressive yeah. than mine so <laughs> can you explain uh now that we're on the preamp set or the the rack section so how yeah. do you have all the preamps and power amps talking to each other um yeah well, let, me, let me go one stop before we get there yep um so all my amps rather than use their effects loop i'm using the power station's effects loop. uh yep great so when i switch i go into the rack so and the effects loop goes all the way across the room mm -hmm. to all my effects racks and my patch base. So I can sit there and throw anything in the loop. I want. Yep. 
So that's, yeah. Awesome. So from here, it comes over. First thing it hits over in the rack is a rack mount decimator mm-hmm. to get all that rack noise out of, mm-hmm. out of the equation. So I've got that. And then from there, it goes into one of seven Voodoo Lab GCXs. Oh. Each, each one of those loops has a preamp in it. Wow. And, and at one time, when, when the rack was smaller, <laughs> I, uh, I went in there and measured how much cable I had between everything. Mm-hmm. It was a good 100 feet of cable. If you, if you measured out a foot from here to here, a foot from here to here, all the loops that you do in the back of the GCX to go and jump all the channels and everything, yep. it, was, it was ungodly. So what I ended up doing is opening up almost every one of these GCXs and putting jumpers inside. Oh, because okay. it's going to be one purpose. So I cut feet out every, you know, every eight feet out of every GCX I cut out. Because so I wanted to make sure that I was, and I think I still, I still lose some top end, I think, if I went through it every day. Are there, internal, I I pulled, are there actually internal jumpers in there? I thought it was just, you could only go out from no. one. Right. No, no, no. I, I soldered a, a wire that jumped the signal from gotcha. one to the other. And <laughs> yeah, I, I modified every one of them yep. to get rid of the plugs on the back. All seven so, of them. Yeah, all seven of them. And there's seven ground controls right here so wow. i can independently cut in and cut out each one of these preamps so i can go all right what does that langner sound like compared to that vht gp3 mm-hmm. boom boom okay hit hit all right what is this all right and i have the, I have the same by the way everything i'm saying exists over here in the base rack too yeah so i can go from from there's three gcx's and no four gcx's four ground controls on this side yeah, Voodoo Labs. I'm endorsing Voodoo Labs at this point. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. You're keeping <laughs> so them that's, up. Oh yeah. So so that's how all of they all of them run. And then from the the last output, and I'm I'm toying with this because they're they're all chained together one by one. I bought a, a radial JD7 up oh, on yeah. top, and I was thinking of running them all in parallel. But then the problem is now I've got to sum all those into a mixer yep. and then bring the mixer output into. And I'm like, I don't. Is it really, is it worth it? I mean. I have um, I might as well complete the journey and figure it out because I suppose so. You know, it's, there's a saying with with Michael Nielsen and I is with Racker we have to know. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, you gotta yeah. buy it because we have to know. <laughs> okay, so it just uh, okay. Two things. Um, firstly, yeah. the the Voodoo Lab switches. Can you do you have to turn one off before you turn the next one on? You do. Yeah, you do. Okay. So uh, it's a, it's a it's a tap dance. Yeah. So when I when I did the video where. Oof. What, which one did I do? I did a video where I did you no know, the power amps. I like to do sit there with the, with the switch. And go like that. Um, there is one where I use a looper, and I had to go through several different preamps. That's what I did. I just went off, on, off, on, um, in between the different the different preamps. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's kind of a pain. If I could find, well, the one thing I found is I could probably consolidate the ground controls mm-hmm. if I bought the what's what's the big RGM. Like thirty oh, button. I'm not sure what that one's called. But. Controller. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah I, the Mastermind or the GT22 or something. Yeah, it's, it, but it's like this giant pedal board that you can address everything. I and mean, if I should just MIDI everything, really. Is what I, should do. Just, I mean, you could do it with the Morningstar as well. If you'd have happy to have pages, you could have you could just scroll <laughs> and be like, you know, I, I've got the actually it's on the floor right now. My MC8 uh, with eight, yeah. eight buttons, and I have it set up so that six of those buttons do like set list things for me and then the other two uh, are just um like page up page down so you know but that, that would be probably one more step than going all right this one <laughs> and the one on the other side that one yeah possibly <laughs> yeah. yeah um so I mean, it's, i'm using the switchblade with my rack now for all of that and yeah. like that's kind of does the switching and you can do the parallel mixing and things like that so oh. it's i mean i took a lot of inspiration from your setup where it's like You've got all this stuff, but you can actually use it. And that was a big thing. Like, if I wanted to use a 2290, I'd have to cable it in and then use a parallel mixer, you know. Yeah. And I just wasn't doing it. Whereas now it's like I use the Axe FX as like the brain. So that can send MIDI and I can use the software editor in it. And I can set up a scene mm-hmm. where I'm like, cool, I want to hear, I want to hear the 2290 and just press a button on the FC controller, which sends a MIDI signal to the switchblade and says, activate that loop. And oh, wow. I want it in parallel, or do I want it pre or post? And it's a really, really well thought out system. Don't give um, me any ideas, Leon. No, oh, <laughs> no, it's actually. I was like, oh yeah, whatever. But it's, I would say, in a setup where you've got a single, like you know, ten to sixteen space rack with 
yeah. four or five effects units that you're actually going to mm. use all the time, it's invaluable. But when I think the way you're doing it where it's like everything in the universe possible, it kind of makes sense to have a button for everything where you're like, cool, okay, mm. at least then I have some kind of semblance of knowing where I am rather than what was that preset again? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I want to be able to go and say, how, what does this sound like compared to this? Yes. And go back and forth and, and have that. And that's, that's, that's really why a lot of this exists in the way that I float everything is I want to be able to compare everything with everything through everything. Yep. So so you hit the end of the, the GCX. Oh, sorry. And you, one, one more question on that. Um, and so, Leon, I remember years ago, you did a rack preamp shootout. Where, oh, yeah. yeah. Where, um, uh, I can't remember which one that there was like four racks in a unit and you were using, cause w he and I both have the Rocktron um, eight. What is it? The, what's it called? The uh, patch bait. Patch bait, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I remember there was some issues with there being a bit of noise and also the preamps not sounding like fully correct. Do you remember what, what that was about Leon? Or at least one of them. Yeah, sounded yeah, a bit funky. Someone saying, Oh, with that, you get impedance issues with some of the preamps. Yeah. yeah so I was going to actually just ask you about this because is that a, like, I, I can't understand how that actually is an issue with this setup if you're only wanting like if you're turning one on one on and one off and you're not running things like in series or parallel or anything. I don't understand how impedance would be an issue. So clearly if you're running a similar situation, it it isn't an issue, but it's it's more capacitance. It's the length of cable right. between between yeah, right. because I'm I'm running seven GCXs, which has got to be the good twenty, thirty feet of cable. Yeah. Because I'm going loop to loop to loop all the way through. Even though I've, I've modified a bunch of them, there's still a jumper that goes between one GS, GCX yeah. to the next GSX. Yeah, GCX, of course. All the way down, yeah. Well, see, that makes sense then, to me, not yeah. so much the like the impedance thing. So that was, yeah. um yeah. I want to ask because you, I mean, you've got it set up. So I was just curious as to, yeah. How that well, and whenever I make a major change to the routing, it's almost like I have to re-EQ some things. Oh, okay. Certain, certain preamps don't respond well to changing the environment. <laughs> and you gotta go in there and just, yeah there, there's like um yeah i'll just say i'll just I'll, yeah there's there's a, there's a spot a little bit farther down the chain okay for a story that that kind of explains that one sure um, but so, so anyway so, yeah continue so so the end of the gcx line all the preamps go into the patch bay so i have three three patch bays nice. here um that way i can route it to any effects um each one of the effects has in its ins and outs in the patch bay I have a Red 7 MLSM that I can, that's also route, each input and output is routed to the patch bay. So I can go and route anything I want to anything I want. I've got a line mixer here as well that I can go and do. So I made the patch bay portion really modular. Yep. So every one of my effects units in the big rack, all, all my multi effects are actually to my right below here. Okay. Um, and then, well, I, I have a set, PCM 70 and a PCM. 80 right here on top of my 3000. That's the only other effects I have here. But everything is accessible through the patch bay. Mm -hmm. And also the effects loop goes to the patch bay. That way I can oh, choose cool. everything. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Okay. Then yeah. you've got yeah. Um, Man, what, yeah. a, what a, I mean, for such a vast amount of gear, the, I'm not going to call it a simple setup, but like a well thought out setup, yeah. you know, where, I without without having I guess there would be other ways to do it, but to actually just have it where you can come in again, you knock off after a day of work, you're stressed, you want to make some loud noises, plug a guitar in and just go. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And it's like what 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 preamp do I want to use? What effect do I want to use? I mean, let me plug these two cables in, hit this button, and here we're off running. Yeah. Um, and if I want to be Oh, sorry. If no, I wanted no. to be really fancy, I'd use the MSLM to layer either series parallel effects. I wanted to go stereo and be able to hear it through the monitors. I could do that, or if I can go, or I can go mono. Which the sad thing is, everything is mono um, in the rack because they're all going to a power amp, and I'm only using one of the sides to yeah, go back right. to yeah. the amp to then go to the the cabinets. Yeah, I've been thinking about that with my setup. About if I like you have with um, your power station setup. I I think I mentioned this to Nielsen when we were speaking to him the other week, but. Or something similar to this, but yeah. If, again, if I replaced my um, my reload there with a, a power station, um, I could use the effects send out into like you know whatever, or run it into a, a cab M 
for example, because I've got one of those and then run that into my, uh, like a stereo reverb or something like that. And then just take that signal and go straight into Pro Tools. So I still have, it's a, it's a wet, dry, wet, but it's also independent of a, um, recorder signal. So you can still balance after the fact, if you wanted to, I thought about that. Anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> one question actually, uh, what are you using cable wise? Is it, uh, have you got a specific type of cable that you enjoy using or does it matter for you? I, I'm pretty easy on that one. Yep. I, I, I've bought all different types. Types. What's good about you know like Amazon in particular, even how evil they are, I look at my history and go, what did I buy for speaker cables last time? That seemed to work pretty well. Let's buy those again. Yeah. yeah. I know? was thinking, man, it's like, and you're, yeah, what, what TRS cables did I buy last yeah. time that have lasted well beyond their price point? I'll just get them again. Yeah. I'm on them again. A, exactly. I'm, I'm about to do another big cable order. I did some about a week ago. Um, so I'm just thinking about it again. I, I told Leon cause I made one of those, um, a cable with one of the Neutrik silent plugs on it. I think Nielsen's oh, wow, got okay. one of those, but it's funny because I bought the parts to make that and it cost, uh, it's in Australian dollars, about $50 Australian and the exact same cable that I made, I could buy made by the same shop for $164 Australian. So for the parts plus about six minutes of labor, <laughs> I've saved about <laughs> over a hundred dollars. <laughs> Um, so oh, that, yeah. that was very funny. Um, but anyway, sorry, continue. I'm, I'm, uh, that's... I, I, I don't even want to guess how much money in cables I have yeah. behind all this stuff. Because it's it's an incremental thing where, oh, a new piece comes in. All right, yep. let's find more cables to put all this stuff. Up. I love making them personally, so I'm like down with it. But it's uh, having lots okay. of cables and stuff. But anyway, uh, next step on the chain. So out of the um, patch bay, we go we go to a buffer. So this, this is where things go veer off. I mean, there's no way you're going to be able to hook up and split the signal to. Hold on, let me let me count them here. There's 16 power amps over here. <laughs> so, so I found out really quickly at eight power amps that you can't split a signal in doing that because right. what will happen is all the inputs of all the amps will load down the signal, mm -hmm. and you're gonna, you're going to lose. You're gonna, in the beginning, you're going you're going to lose fidelity, and then you're going to just lose signal yep. at that point because they're all going parallel. So. They do not make, no one makes a line buffer for right. guitar. So I had to go to the synth guys and buy a Euro rack case oh my with God. line buffer modules. Right. <laughs> no one knows this, but you guys at this end, everybody else <laughs> watches this. But behind each one of these racks is a Euro rack where I have an in <laughs> and then I have it split out. To each one of the power amps, oh, and each power amp goes to a because even even KH, KHG and I did the test over here on the bass rack. Mm -hmm. KHG said you can do line level signals through the in, the input and then the output to all the amps. Right, it'll support it. I tried it; doesn't sound good. Right, and that's on bass. <laughs> I can imagine <laughs> what it'll do in yeah. guitar. So so all of the the major amp switchers are all doing guitar. You know, low you know guitar level signal not doing line level so in order to solve this i yeah i had to go and improvise yeah which is sad which is really sad okay check it out um see if i have one look at this you have to buy these ah <laughs> uh, quarter inch quarter to inch like little mini jacks yeah it's, yeah yeah somebody out there it's probably gonna end up being me please make a rack mount line level splitter with buffer <laughs> that you can go one in and well for me crazy people Let's do like a 24 out, you know, just for expansion purposes. So I can have 24 yeah, power amps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't, I feel like you could probably build that if you. Yeah, you, you could build it. It's it just, no one makes it off the shelf. Yeah. And I really didn't feel like making one. No, that's fair <laughs> so enough. I, so There's so always a solution. So, There's always a solution. Yeah. So currently each one of these power amps outputs is, um, is controlled by an Ampeg system selector, which was uh, yeah. yeah showroom piece. Mm -hmm. There was one. It was with eight amps, eight amps, eight, eight cabs. I modified one of them to be 16 amps, three cabs. Um, but even that, if I use all the cabs that, that, then I have another eight over there, but I'm going to do KHE for the rack. Yep. And just yeah, that's not cool. use their guitar, you know, signal level stuff and just use the cab switcher. Yep. And that's going to feed back into, you know, the amps back there, back into the cabs. And that way, you know, I can go. So you can imagine, I, I could A, B, back and forth with that Ampeat um, um, remote rack versus head. Rack power amp versus head. Same effects loop because it's going through the you know power station. 
Yeah. Because I'm going to attenuate everything. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. So it's going to be a global thing. And I, I can know whether, you know, this, you know, Plexi, you know, the Valve Sonic sounds like a Plexi. Oh, really? Or let's find out for real. All right, there you go. <laughs> That that uh, Bogner Ecstasy Synergy module does it sound like an Ecstasy? Let's find out. Boom. Yeah. You know, SLO does it, does it sound like an SLO? Boom. You know, and you can do it back and forth. So that's is that was the whole thing. Is this yeah. something you're gonna plan on doing some clips with once it's fully integrated? As kind of you know, you've got the walk-in library of stuff. Uh, can you see yourself making an archive of clips? I I really I really want to because I that's one of the things when I've talked to Michael Nielsen about it. Yeah, he did. He did a couple of giant videos where he did all the delays. He did yeah. all the courses, and it really was. And he explained it. It was really a kind of like, like you said, a library of. All right, what did that sound like? All right, let me go back to the video. Hit the hit the seek button to where that was. Okay, that's what that sounded like. All right, it, it would be really cool to do that. And the one thing that I've I've gotten out of a lot of the comments um, was that, you know, not everybody has this stuff. At the same time, a lot of people are going by yeah, memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I can sit there and go, all right, you, you know, that thing you said, you thought sounded so awesome, and you pine for it, even though you have this new thing. Let's see, really, what they sound like compared to each other on a neutral playing field with a power amp and a speaker cabinet and whatever effects you want to do. That's such a good point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because because some of the things you you think sound awesome may may not really sound that awesome, or it may be completely redundant. That's that's the other sad thing is. There's a lot of knobs here that do the exact same thing as another knob in another unit that sound, yeah. That the, the one thing I was going to say back to where, you know, we're loading down all the yeah, power amp inputs mm -hmm. is some of these preamps can handle that better based on the design of the preamp. Right. Like a, a Saldano, which has a Catholic follower inside, has a all buffer right. inside, that can handle being hooked up simultaneously to multiple power amps and it won't load and degrade the signal. Mm -hmm. um, the worst offender, I have a phase, uh, it's not a daisy cutter, but it's one of phase, phase is a, as an amp, uh, and preamp and power amp maker up in Canada. Um, I have one of his preamps in a head box that thing could not handle being set up in multiple. I mean, the, the signal would just go away completely wow. right. once you hooked everything up. Yeah, it was because he did, he doesn't have a buffer on the output. It was basically from the last ampl amplification stage right out to the jack, nothing in between. Right. And you could totally just load that down. So if it was a properly designed preamp, you know, for that purpose, you could totally get maybe, you know, eight. You can't do, you know, like this 16 that I don't know, 24 I've got going on here is, yeah, I'm insane. <laughs> yeah. But I have them all. Yeah. <laughs> I have almost all of them. Or at awesome. least a representative of all of them. I'm, I'm so curious to know what, you know, what people make of this collection. Like, let us know in the comments as well is, you know, is, is this is this people's idea of, a dream rig or is it a nightmare? It's obviously a dream rig for you and for a lot of people, but, uh, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. So I, I really respect that, you know, these things are being used and you're maintaining them. And, you know, when you put some clips out, it's sort of like there's the, as you said, not everyone can have all this stuff all at the same time. So if you're in a position where you can, I guess kind of, you know, it's like community service, isn't it? It's like, Hey, I've got all this crazy stuff. I actually want to pay it forward a little bit and let people hear yeah. it so they can maybe use them as reference clips. Or, you know, if you get the, you know, Friday night, you got nothing to do, you're on eBay, you're like, oh, maybe I'll buy this old thing. Before you do it, being able to actually go and hear it. And maybe if you go, well, yeah, I definitely want that. That's a good idea. Or, oh, uh, actually, I should spend my money on something else. And I've had people make those comments when I did the power amp comparison where I ran through all the power amps. People were saying, yeah. That totally turned me off on this one. I want to buy that one now because yeah. compared to all these, that's the sound I'm going for. Yeah, and it's, I, and it's different strokes, different folks too. Some people love Fry's sound, exactly. the way, you know, and then some some like Mesa. It's yeah, I there's found no that, wrong answer. Yeah, I found that really valuable. Actually, I might watch that one again because um, I'm I need to do a bit more uh, power amp messing around. I've got a I've got a couple okay. of ideas, but anyway, so sorry for the time. Um, <laughs> Mate, I got to do part two because there's like double the power amps now. Ah, uh, yeah, no, say, yeah. Well, oh, should I'm we really should we wrap it up? Should we wrap it up there? And yeah, uh, I'm, I, I'm blown away by <laughs> how little we actually got to in this amazing collection. So, Michael, you do have a YouTube channel, don't you, that people can go and check out? I, I am not as active as I'd love to be on there, um, but I do have one, and I and I do. 
I have plans. I just need to, to just buckle down and make the time and do it. No, it's man, it's awesome. Like, first, thank you for the inspiration with all the rack stuff and, you know, for being so generous with your time today. And, you know, we get to hear so many of these units on your YouTube channel and Michael Nielsen's YouTube channel as well. So it's, uh, you know, kind of, there's definitely an element of keeping it, keeping this stuff alive. You know, this, yeah. this gear is only as valuable as the thing, as the music that's being made on them. So, uh, it's, it's kind of cool to one, finally connect with you and have some of your insight and some of your knowledge on here and, Two to just like marvel at like what you've what you've done and the collection you've put together. It's it's incredible. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. I mean, what, one of the things I always wanted to do with all this is share with the community mm -hmm. because I mean that's what we do. We get online, we take a look at all right, what is you know, what is the first thing we do when we want to research a piece of gear? All right, is that gear on YouTube? Did somebody demo this? Yeah, yeah. What does this thing sound like? And in and I'm I'm in kind of a unique situation where I can demo and kind of create an encyclopedia of now michael nielsen is much better at this <laughs> but I, it's there's only so many hours of the day we'll yeah. Just say it that way. yeah 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 and that's, and that's why i was really happy in the beginning just kind of feeding him gear going all right man you got to do this one this one's really awesome and and just going through <laughs> and it's kind of like feeding the monster a little bit um but there's just there's just so much gear it's and i and i and i, I do i do want to take your advice on the coffee table book I just realized yeah, I how much work that's going to be. <laughs> Wait, would you would you accept uh, like a I don't know um, either a Facebook post or or a an Instagram post of here's the preamp of the day, here's a yeah. picture, here's a couple of specs on the side. I think I think I mean that'd be that'd be useful or even an Instagram yeah. or you know yeah that's a great idea just like basic website where it's like oh because I know there's um the website Vintage Digital. Where they've got a lot of stuff on there, but it's sort of the pro audio focus. It'd be cool, huh. like having that online resource where you're just like, "Oh, cool, yeah, the Casher Rock Mod Two, uh, made here, uses this. Here's a sound clip. Like that'd be that'd be pretty amazing." Oh wow! Now, now I got to host a domain and <laughs> maintain a website. <laughs> Well, well this, this you is, know, you can go to our sponsor today, <laughs> squarespace.com. No, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we just got to do it enough where we can get these high level sponsors. So, yep. yeah, Michael, thank you so much. Thank what you guys for having me. We'll have to do uh, round two in the not too distant future. And uh, for anyone who wants to find you, your YouTube channel is Michael Torin. Look it up, be amazed. And uh, thank you so much to everybody who's tuned in. Uh, and Troy, we will see you all next time on the Gear Podcast. Peace. Thank you very much.